I'll be right back. Okay, good luck. Um, this was kind of a big download for me, Nick. This isn't something that I had actually had a ton of familiarity with. I've done some of this I've done, yeah. and I've sort of ordered it in order of my comfort level and also what I think is like reasonable to attempt at focus. I think everything I'm putting in here is reasonable to attempt. There's some things that they're proposing for airway and face ultrasound that I think not only is it not like maybe helpful, it's probably also not super testable stuff, but all this stuff I think is both of those things. I'm doing them in order of, of, of I think, like ascending radicalness, so radicality. <laughs> radicality. So here are my six reasonable applications of airway pocus. And the top peritonsillar abscess visualization and evaluation is the most. And then going down is like an ascending sort of like cusp of uh, where the state of focus is, you know. So difficult airway assessment is cool and has some really interesting parts, but probably isn't 100% ready for prime time. And actually, in ascending order, these all probably have avenues for studies if you wanted to ever do them. Yeah, so there's a lot to that. It's like difficult airway and just like airway assessment in general. And um, so we'll go over it. I guess start with the peritons, their abscess. Yeah. And because this is not stuff that we've done a ton of in the ED, we don't have a ton of like moving pictures yet for some of this stuff, but um, but rather like um, slide deck stuff from the textbook, which is pretty good. So peritonsillar abscess, most common deep space infection of the head and neck region. Usually it's a complication of the progression of tonsillitis and tonsillar cellulitis. There's a lot of overlap, I think, clinically when you're assessing somebody tonsillitis, peritonsillar cellulitis, peritonsillar abscess. And a lot of times in RED, and I think practice sort of pattern in general, people are getting CTs for this more often than not. I think you probably don't need that. And this is actually a very good modality. We're talking like 90, 100% sensitive slash specific for diagnosing a peritonsillar abscess. So, you know, kind of dovetails, I think, with the push that we're having now in the department of ordering fewer CTs per 100 patients. So possible avenue. Is this something you've done? Yeah, or just about eval. Like ultrasound? Ultrasound, yeah. No, okay. I mean, like I know of it, not like, yes. The, the way to do it is with the curvilinear, or rather the uh, the endocavitary probe, yeah. because you have that, like, the kind of ideal footprint for that. It fits in the space. It's why we, at the bedside, we always try to call it endocavitary probe and not endo, you know, endovaginal or transvaginal probe, because you don't want people to have that connotation. And it's pretty easy to find this sort of tonsillar structure. Here's a normal one, sonographically. Uh, tonsil looks like, um, you know, sort of, sort of heterogeneous, maybe like a gland, like a lymph node that you've seen before. It's a, uh, small, like if you, if we had the, the tick marks on the side, this thing is like a centimeter and a half. The, the advantage is you can just have, you can just put it right on top of it and you got it, got it in your sites. The other advantage is that you can see in the far field, see this red circle, you, big red. There's a big red tube in your neck. <laughs> this is what you don't want to hit. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, you know, if you don't put the color on, you have this little anechoic circle in the back. Um, so these are the two things you want to characterize: sort of the, the the tonsil, and then you want to find the depth and the location of the carotid artery. Here's uh, one on the right is normal size. The one on the left is getting a little big, and so tonsillitis sonographically is basically the tonsil becomes enlarged greater than two centimeters in any one dimension. So if you get it in its greatest dimension and you measure across, two centimeters, I mean, it's also a clinical diagnosis, but sonographic diagnosis, two centimeters, that's easy to remember. And uh, what you get with the cellulitis, once that starts, so you have en enlargement is tonsillitis, and then peritonsillar or tonsillar cellulitis is where it's sort of a spectrum. It's like any other kind of soft, to, soft tissue cellulitis, but basically you get increased um, heterogeny there and uh, you might get a little soft tissue edema surrounding, but this is not an abscess yet. This is for tonsillar cellulitis. So it's enlarged. It becomes more heterogeneous and you see that kind of edema and maybe like a little hemorrhage or a purulence like beginning to happen. A CT scan might call this phlegminous changes, but ultrasound, we don't see like a discrete collection. There is also such an, entity as intratonsillar abscess, where you have the tonsil that's enlarged and has some maybe 
some inflammatory changes, and then there's actually like a little pocket of pus. If you push on it, it might squish around the way that pus does. This is stuff you're kind of familiar with because you've done soft tissue ultrasound. It's this like lives under the soft tissue ultrasound chapter in the Mon Matir book. So this really is just that. The only difference is that you have this probe in somebody's mouth right on this particular spot. And then the parent tonsillar abscess looks like an abscess. There's no magic. Put a little pressure on there. You can see the debris move around. You put some color on there. You should have kind of minimal flow within that. Maybe a little bit of a little bit of color. This is the idea. There's another one. Peritonsillar abscess, sort of complex, hypoechoic or maybe anechoic, usually ill-defined margins. But this is sort of gives you an idea how it's a spectrum with cellulitis to the peritonsillar abscess. And what we like to do here is first of all decide whether or not there is an abscess, which is worthy of draining, and then find the carotid artery. And uh, you could turn your probe and get it in the long axis too. This is this is wise to do. So when I drain these peritonsillar abscesses, I would like to know the depth of the carotid artery from the soft tissue, right? So it's like sort of back of the throat to the carotid. And if I know that it's, this, in this case, three and a half centimeters, then I'm choosing a needle or I'm putting a cap on the needle and kind of tip the cap off less than that, like maybe put it at two centimeters just so I have like zero chance of getting the carotid artery. Because you don't want to nick the carotid artery in a non-compressible spot. You can hit, like when you're doing a, like, I don't freak out. If a no, resident, I do with that one too. Totally, you know what I mean? And like if the, if the resident is doing a central line and they're trying to get the IJ and they hit the carotid artery, you can compress it. This is a little more complicated if you start poking holes in the carotid artery back here. Yeah. And in the airway. You could probably get into some trouble. I mean, usually you get away with it, but I would say it's out of an abundance of caution. Give yourself like a, at least a centimeter, centimeter and a half of, of leeway to not be able to touch it. Yeah. I so the cut the top of the cap off, measure out, say, oh, okay, I got two centimeters to work with. And you can see that the abscess is rather superficial. These are centimeters, these big ones. So it's like a half a centimeter deep. So you don't need that much. Somebody fanning across inflamed tonsil and the peritonsillar abscess. That's pretty gettable. And when you're doing this in real life, it sort of looks a little ridiculous, but I mean, this is what you're sort of talking about. If you're gonna do this dynamically, so you have the endocavitary probe, this one's got a cover on it. They're, they're they look really condom-like, just really <laughs> nailing home. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool guys, <laughs> cool covers. <laughs> but you, the idea here is that you can do this dynamically. As long as there's enough jaw mobility, I think this is a pretty reasonable thing to do. And then here they are like dynamically getting the needle within the, in real with in real time. Yeah, I think it's a pretty sweet way to go. It hurts. I mean, we're not gonna go over really how to do this procedure, but really how to do this procedure is do a little hurricane spray in the back, make get your measurements, make sure you actually have an abscess, you're not just poking at cellulitis, and then do it dynamically, or you know, you don't have to do it dynamically. The other cool thing about it is you can sort of do pre and post procedure and see that you do have resolution of the pus. This is a super reasonable application of airway ultrasound. No controversy, something I've done many times. Once we have, you know, more up and running our endocavitary pro program here, this is something we should do like every time you suspect a peritonsillar abscess. And we should get away probably from doing the CT scan, unless you're thinking about um, retropharyngeal abscess. But usually you can kind of tell the difference. Yeah. I mean, usually just clinically you say, okay, there's at least cellulitis there in the peritonsillar or bad, bad um, tonsillitis. Um, so totally, totally reasonable. Also totally reasonable is assessment for front of neck access for cricothyrotomy in the case. Um, Life-saving procedure in the can I intubate, can I ventilate situation. Have you done one of these? Hmm. Not just sim stuff. Sim stuff. So you've done a non-bodies. Um, you know, a lot of times you can get away with just knowing your landmarks really well. A lot of times you can get away with that. Um, let me pull up what we actually have here. So just to remind you, because we're going to have to go through all this. So what we access in the ER is the um, the cricothyroid membrane. We're not doing trachs in the ER. We're kind of a bloody mess to try to do a trach. People can screw that up. So your landmarks for that is really the thyroid cartilage. And just sort of inferior to that, you have the membrane and then the cricoid cartilage, which is the only circumferential bit of cartilage around the trachea. And then you go down the tracheal rings. Other things in that neighborhood are like the strap muscles coming down across and then the thyroid cartilage. And that's all pretty palpable in somebody who's got a regular kind of neck anatomy. But once you get like, uh, like, like once you, yeah, right. And these people exist. <laughs> I mean, I thought, I thought this was not, not just in Austin, not just in Austin Powers two and three. Yeah. 
but in, in real life. Which movies he's in. Yeah, yeah. I just feel like, you know, you can just imagine you cannot intimate, cannot ventilate case here, and you need front of neck access. It could get really hairy trying to decide, well, where's this guy's, where's this guy's, where's this guy's even, yeah, tracheal cartilage. I can't even find the thyroid cartilage. So what we'd propose to do with the ultrasound is to find your landmarks. And what you do is basically take a transverse approach, get your linear probe, take a transverse approach. And I've been doing this a lot this week in preparation for this and looking at a lot of different uh, people's cartilage. So the thyroid cartilage is, of all the things in the airway, it's the most recognizable thing. It looks like a pyramid. It's got this, it's got this very sort of pointy sort of shape to it, right? Um, so what I would do in case of fat bastard, if I need to get his neck accessed, is I would go, I would put the probe where I think his cricoid membrane is, and then I would slide up until I see this, because this is a really easily identifiable landmark, right? Nothing else looks like this upside down V in the neck or shouldn't. And it's relatively high, and this is his thyroid cartilage, okay? And you know that the cricoid membrane is going to be just inferior to this. In general, this is pretty hyperechoic and pretty shadowy structure. Um, some people, it's not totally in kids. It's not... Um, it's not as like calcified, or at least the cartilage isn't as thick. And so you can actually see right through it. You can see like where the vocal cords are, but it still has that same characteristic shape of the V, right? So whether or not it's totally, whether or not it's see-through like this, this is a kid's, or it's shadowy like this, it has that same pointy shape and nothing else in the neck really should have that. So that's like your home base. So put your probe where you think the cricoid membrane is, slide up until you see the pointy thing, and then just slide down. And what the cricoid cartilage looks like is sort of around on top um, and uh, really bright sort of echogenicity here because the change in impedance between the soft tissue and the air. Mm. And then just below it, you should find the cricoid membrane. So start up, pyramid, upside down V, slide just below, and this is where you wanna go. And then just to make sure you know where you're at, slide down a little more and you get this like curvilinear heavy shadow cricoid cartilage. That's pretty much it. You could mark it in the axial orientation here, so you know at like what level, and then turn your probe longitudinally, just like we do with the okay. LP, yeah. and you should be able to see it. So the way it looks, you got to look at a few of these to kind of get used to it. The way it looks in long axis is the thyroid cartilage has like this slope. It's got a heavy shadow usually, and then there'll be a drop off, and you can see the cricoid membrane. It's like this bright sort of air soft tissue interface. And then the cricoid cartilage, which is below that, looks a little more like cartilage. It's a little sort of more echogenous, and it has a little bit of a shadow. And this is where you're shooting for. It's pretty doable. So this is one example. Here's another example. Thyroid cartilage up here, cricoid membrane, cricoid cartilage here. See that? That's sort of dark. And not everybody's is going to have the same echogenicity. Here's, here's your boys. This is mine. So this is my thyroid cartilage. Mine's still a little see-through, it looks like, but it has that characteristic kind of V shape to it, right? That's easy. And then when I slide down my neck, that's my cricoid. So, so thyroid cartilage here, and then I slide down a little bit, and you see the cricoid membrane. as It's sort of bright, and it's got the A-lines coming off of it because it's that really bright soft tissue air interface. And then when I turn the probe long axis on my neck, classic. You got that sort of downslope of the thyroid cartilage, thyroid membrane, cricoid cartilage. If you ever do need to crike me, I, I would suggest you probably don't need to do ultrasound first. Don't feel like you have to, because you can feel my memory, unless anything, unless like things get out of control um, with my diet, perhaps, or if I get a lot of swelling that day. <laughs> you want to? All right. Yeah. Honestly, I don't. Just, just. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so I wanted to get you used to looking a little bit at the long axis of the of the neck and what things look like. And so this is the thyroid cartilage, cricoid membrane, cricoid cartilage. If you slide down a little further inferior, you'll see this. You'll see cricoid cartilage, and then the tracheal rings are these sort of anechoic, sometimes heavily shadowing uh, structures on top of the trachea. You feel pretty good about that? Yeah, I'm just telling her where we are. She didn't know where that. Oh, she was on ultrasound. Oh, yeah. yeah. Tell her she's got time. Tell her to come at like 1.20, 1.30. Everything got slowed down today because of my EMS uh, meeting. Um, so cricothyrotomy, landmark, front of neck access, I think is a totally reasonable thing to attempt with the ultrasound. And now you know how to do it. What kind of text are you writing?
How many words? No, I'm just telling her where we are, and then that no, she had to rush. Over. No rush. She doesn't have a lot of rush in her game. She's like, she takes her time just the way I do. It's a, it's a, it's like it's an insult that my wife levels at me. She's like, you never rush anywhere, but that's like, that's good. Yeah, sometimes I should rush, but I never do. It shows, it shows yeah, okay, thanks. Those first two things are. <laughs> I just feel like you should have my back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, be more relaxed. Yeah. More zen. More zen. Okay, so uh, paratonsillar abscess is obvious. Cricothyrotomy landmarks is obvious. Mm. ET tube confirmation is a little fringier, but also a totally reasonable thing to try to get after. And I've been doing this. Hey, you can hang, man. We're just we're going through some. This isn't something you need to worry about, but you can come hang and, and watch. This it. is uh, anesthesia. Yeah, so this is a. Uh, oh, this, this might is, be sort of. Yeah, happens. Come on. This is something I've been doing for at the bedside. Yeah. Um, it's not the standard of care, but I think it's great. You know, you could, especially, um, hmm, what's the current standard for ET tube confirmation? There's a few things. Auscultation, yeah. capnography. They're not doing like, they're not pulling an x-ray machine into all the cases upstairs. No. But capnography, you know, is, is really what you yeah, need. Yeah, capnography. That's the main mm -hmm. thing. Um, in our patients who are not optimized with it, they're in the OR. Capnography is less reliable. A lot of our patients have had like bag valves mask ventilation their stomachs can be um, full of carbonated beverages that does happen occasionally and so you can get a signal of like major co2 coming up when you're totally tube the goose um, we also intubate patients who are in like cardiac arrest or have like profound cardiopulmonary collapse in whom they don't make good carbon dioxide because they're, they're no longer performing like respiration and, and metabolism so in those cases capnography can be a little unreliable which is where this comes in. So listening is sort of always a reasonable thing to do. Um, chest X-ray is not really helpful in terms of a esophagus or the trachea. It's good for depth of tube placement. Yeah. Um, but this is a good adjunct to try to help you decide are you in the esophagus or the trachea. I found one study actually that said waveform uh, capnography in the setting of a cardiac arrest is like 60%, 60% uh, sensitive for identifying intracheal intubation. So not super, super useful. Um, Tracheal ultrasound is, I have the number here, 98, 99% sensitive and 97% specific. So it's actually very, very good. That's for adults and for peds, it hovers around 100%, um, if you know what you're doing. So I've incorporated this into my assessment. I did it this weekend on a really sick guy who was um, oh, perio arrest that we intubated. He was like 30, it was a crazy case. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's what you need to sort of accustom yourself to, is the way that the trachea looks down by the area of the thyroid cartilage. This is your spot to go to. This is down by the suprasternal notch. So I want to show you like on the outside we're talking about. This guy's got a dope goatee and here they are down by his thyroid cartilage. G, G is like the gland, right? And then A is his airway, uh, the trachea. And where the esophagus lives usually, not always, but usually, is off to the side. Usually the patient's left, although sometimes they're right and sometimes right behind. It's more, it's more fun if it's just to the side. And usually, um, and I think almost everybody I've looked on, it's just to the left. That's just a, a fact of anatomy. And it's this flat kind of pancake looking thing, kind of anechoic, it doesn't cast a shadow. And you got to sort of contrast to the way that the trachea looks, which is like bright on top, usually kind of circular or semicircular, and cast a big time shadow because it's full of air. You got a big air shadow. So this is the, this is the left side of my dude's neck. Here's the right side. So you see absence of the esophagus. You can see a big captain carotid here and then the thyroid. Did you see that? It's sort of subtle. Do you know what's going on here? No, no, they're not intubating him. It's just, yeah, what, what ha what's happening? What, like, what physiologic event is taking place here? Yeah, swallowing, just swallowing water. That's what it looks like. So what you see transiently, the esophagus is filling with like sparkles and, yeah. and slightly mixed architecture. That's just swallowing. It could be swallowing a sip of water or maybe even just their saliva. So that's what it looks like. Yeah, it is kind of cool. I think this is my neck. Can you see my esophagus just a little to the left? I was like, I was not swallowing when I did this. I was just kind of taking the, taking a look, see see what it looks like. But it always looks about the same. Just that little sort of pancake-looking structure right there. 
But the point is, there's only one thing that is like really echogenic and kind of semicircular and casting a big heavy shadow. And that's the way it ought to be <laughs> always, right? Here's somebody who's been intubated, endotracheally intubated in their trachea. And one of the things you can sometimes see is this sort of double curved line effect. So here's like the actual trachea, and then the ET tube shows up as a second curved line, which is cool. This is not super, super duper reliable, but it actually is very nice. The other thing you see is a lack of esophageal intubation, which would be a separate, a separate structure up to the side. Here's another short axis of somebody who's been successfully endotracheally intubated. And you see the difference here where there's like these two curvilinear lines. They both cast, together they cast this heavy shadow. This, this tube happens to be a little bit off to the side, but again, successful endotracheal intubation. I want to show you what this looks like in long axis too, just so you're aware. If you turn the probe long axis, you can see this sort of double line effect too of an endotracheal tube. The other thing that occasionally they do is, and this was, I think one of the uh, residents presented this at Scuff this year. Do you remember? I don't know if you were there. Oh, she the, was, the foreign body aspiration one? No, no, she was proposing that you, and there's no videos of this online. I'll I have to make my own video of it. Um, turn, like, slightly rotate the probe while you're looking at the image of the trachea, and you can actually see, it's almost like a lung sliding kind of effect. Like, you, you twist the probe, twist the tube a little bit while you're looking at the probe, and you can see the interface between the endotracheal tube and the trachea, actually creating, like, a little sort of movement artifact. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, uh, that's sort of a dynamic. In the longitudinal view? Yeah, either. What are you saying? I would probably do it axially, just because you have everything right there. Um, I wanted to show you this image, you know, what's going on here. You see, instead of like this nice double curved line, you have this sort of lumpy bumpy. This is a the uh, balloon filled with air. Yeah. So this is a good this is a good intubation. The balloon once the balloon is filled with air, you get this kind of a regular sort of in interface, and obviously big heavy shadow. I read, we had one article. Uh, I don't know, like those journal clubs, they're saying they're calling the saline. Yeah, I'll I'll get into that. We'll talk about ETQ depth. Yeah, okay. I did that this weekend. Um, here's what it looks like when you unsuccessfully intubate somebody, when you intubate the esophagus. You get basically this double trachea effect, like they call it double track sign. So you have like this curvilinear heavy shadow structure, which is the trachea down by the super, the uh, suprasternal notch. And then right next to it, you got its little brother, which ought not be there. You shouldn't have two tracheas almost ever. Um, here's another case. This one's, they're a little higher up. You see that classic. This is this is up by the uh, thyroid cartilage, but you see that classic double uh, extra trachea right here. Not good. What do you what do you think about this? It's actively actively intubating the esophagus. Yeah. So this is like, this would be if you were doing this dynamically, and I'm not proposing that you always would need to do this dynamically, uh, but you you could do, right? So you could have a second operator or just tell the nurse, hold, can you hold, like, you know, while you're doing your intubation, you say, can you hold this linear probe, hold it right over the supersternal notch, just so I have a good picture of that while you're doing your intubation, and then just look up once you've, you've passed it and you start to slide it in, whether or not it's filling up the esophagus, because you'll always be able to see it at that level. So this is actively somebody, and then you would, you'd pull this out right away. You wouldn't fuck around. You know, because sometimes with capnography, how many how many cycles of breaths are you waiting? Six six cycles of breaths, a few yeah. cycles to confirm yeah, it, right? It takes like three cycles yeah. Your first so then you're like, like in help patient. Exactly. So in this case, you're like you're doing it, and then you have instant. You're instantly saying, okay, well, no good. Let, let, let's bail. Yeah. Um, the literature shows that it, uh, statistically, there's no difference in doing it um, static versus dynamic. Like you can you can tube. Then check versus check, and at the same time, that'd be dynamic. But mm. it depends how much help you have. If I'm standing there while you're doing the intubation, I'll put the probe on while you're doing it. You want to hold light pressure so you're not, you know, moving things around, obviously. Yeah. You can um, cricoid pressure with the ultrasound. Probe. Yeah. <laughs> I, we, we had a tough intubation, actually, where we were doing cricoid pressure this week. I was just, just going to say. So here's somebody, their esophagus act, we had, um, this is a cadaver, I believe. But the esophagus here happens to be a little bit on their on the on the right, and they did an esophageal intubation here. I think intentionally just to show what that looked like. Looks like they're in somebody's living room. Yeah, yeah. I'm a little. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, probably some other. Yeah, it's crazy. If it's a cadaver, they're in someone's living room. Believe me, man, I puzzled over this for 
it's just one of the best videos of this I have. And see how when they do it dynamically, you can see like that sort of sliding artifact of the tube growing in. This is probably somebody's living room. Oh, you know what it is? It's probably a um a fucking nursing home or a, a, a funeral home, right? They probably had the body prepped up in the funeral home. It's got a funeral home vibe, right? It does, and yeah. they're just like, it's it's really 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 they're just like, can we come by? We have an ultrasound and a. You got any face laying around? <laughs> Maybe like the funeral part already happened and like, hey, before you put them in the ground, can we just. um. <laughs> Actually, secure for I put a credit on this because I want this all to go back to Jalen um, Avila, not not me. <laughs> this is all her videos. All right, and here's one. Um, this is a cool one that they, that they did where they actually watch. They have the video of their laryngoscopy, and at the same time they have the ultrasound images. So this is them on successfully intubating this live patient, and just watch what happens. Watch the esophagus get filled up with a ET tube. So you get used to what that looks like, and then they pull it out, and then they successfully intubate, and you can see that sort of um, movement artifact there, and the double curvilinear line of the trachea. So mm. I'm just thinking about like practicality of like using this in like the real world. Yeah, I was concerned about using this for like airway placement. Obviously, like if you're saying most likely esophagus is going to be lateral on the left. Yeah. But you truly don't know if it's always for this. If you don't have, you're not married to looking straight, straight ahead. That's why I showed you the picture of the guy with the goatee. Like if you feel like you're not seeing the esophagus, then you, you're totally able to come from the side. You always be able to see the esophagus. You come from your right side or left side. If the esophagus is right behind the trachea, it's not going to screw you if you come a little from the side. I think the next. I was going to say just like you know, using a curvilinear probe for a bigger footprint. They're using. Yeah, they, yeah. they appear to be using a curvilinear one here with the depth dialed way down. I think, yeah, if you, if you have a comfort level and you know your structures, um, I think Jay Neville actually is a pro curvilinear probe. I'm a little more pro linear probe in this spot. But yeah. I know, you know, I know more than her. <laughs> this is a case we had this week, Melissa and I, of a young man who went into respiratory and then almost cardiac arrest from a bad asthma exacerbation. And um, this is a second after the resident intubated this patient, his sat dropped to zero during the intubation because he went into VTAC and vomited and uh, just bad luck, I guess. Um, and so we, we, there was no time to wait, to waste. You know, I needed to know that the tube was in the trachea right then, because if not, this guy was going to code code. Mm -hmm. So he was defibrillated while he was paralyzed, put the tube in. And then a second later, I put the uh, probe on his neck. Do you think we successfully intubated him based on this that. picture? It, it, it it's not you see this is why you get used to look at these it's not this is successful intubation he had vomit sorry i meant like double as in like yes this double curve yeah yeah, yeah yeah so this was success he has this dark heavy shadow coming off the trachea with a double line and his esophagus is dilated because it's full of vomit but it's not it's fluid right it's not casting a heavy shadow and it's not circular so i knew within two seconds this guy's intubated and says so yeah keep bagging him bagging him bagging him and there's like probably no capnography reading hardly at all um because the guy was like Perry arrest, but we bagged them up and got a good response. So I think for ET2 confirmation, maybe it's not as much like as part of the clinical practice as the first two and like totally, totally on the board. I would do this in all your difficult cases and maybe practice in your not difficult cases just so you have begin to have a feel for it. Because I think it's a great application for ultrasound. Yeah. Now, were these like a typical laryngoscopy you used to get? I think for, for his, his happened to be difficult. He was overweight, his air was full of vomit and he was anterior. Um, but like, you know, I, I would say practice on the easy ones so that when you have a hard one, you kind of know what to look for. Uh, I really like this as an application. The other thing they talk about for ET tube confirmation is using ultrasound through the diaphragm to look at the, the you know, diaphragmatic movement as you're ventilating the patient, because you can look at one diaphragm versus the other. This, however, is not as reliable for confirmation of ET tube confirmation, because obviously if you're ventilating somebody's stomach, you can get movement of the esophagus too. You would just need to be pay close attention to which way it's moving. Like if you put the breath in and the, and the, and the diaphragm goes up, you're not in the right spot, right? If, but you gotta make sure you know which is which. So I would, I would err on the side of looking at the airway rather than the diaphragm in this case. Okay, application number four, ET tube death. Okay, so um, after you've confirmed that you're endotracheal, a lot, of thing, a lot of times what we wanna know in the ED is that this thing is not uh, right main stemmed, right? whether too deep or too shallow. Too deep is a little worse than too shallow. Although too shallow, you can have the thing falling out. So it happens to be the case, I don't know if you know this, that in an appropriate depth uh, in, in intubation, 
the the cuff, the balloon, is right at the level of the supersternal notch. Well, kind of where we're looking anyway to confirm ET tube confirmation, right? So the cuff is right there. There's an old, there's an old, um, this is from an old textbook, but there's advice that if you, you, you inflate the cuff and you push right at the supersternal notch and you feel, and you're feeling with your other hand, the balloon and the sort of more proximal part of the ET tube, if you feel the balloon kind of blow up a little bit when you're pushing right there, that might be a way to determine whether or not you're at the right depth. That's old school. That's cool. And pr you could tell how that would, that would sort of, there's probably some downsides to that. But uh, it's the right idea, right? So it's like, all right, we, we want to make sure the balloon is right at the supersternal notch. And how do we do that ultrasonographically? Well, there's a couple things that have been uh, proposed. Um, put the probe at the supersternal notch and have it there when you're inflating the balloon, and it'll look like this. You see what they're doing there? It's actually yeah, like, it's like yeah, it's like widening and kind of stretching the trachea in that one spot. It's like kind of putting a little bit of pressure. So that's one thing you can do. This is them filling it with air. A cooler, slicker thing to do is to fill it with saline to confirm placement. You're okay to fill, it's safe to fill these balloons with saline uh, temporarily. And what happens there is that instead of having like a heavy shadow of all air artifact, here, here is a trachea filled with, uh, a balloon tra filled with uh, air. And here it is filled with saline. You see what happens is the sides where like where the, where the saline is, you can actually see right through it. And then just where the endotracheal tube itself is, you have that heavy shadow coming down. So let me see if I have a video of Jane Nabila doing that. It's kind of a cool idea. So here, yeah, here he is actually filling up the ET tube. And in addition to being kind of a cool thing, it's like it's it's actually pretty useful because you know that you're at the right location. If this is occurring at the supersternal notch, then you know you're good. And it's fine at this point to take out the saline and fill it with air so that whoever ends up managing the tube doesn't have to worry about there being saline in there. Although they've studied that. And uh, um, it's fine to leave saying anything there. Just not everybody's on board with that. Um, this is, a, again, it's sort of a long axis picture of this here. I want to see if I have them filling it with saline at this spot. So here's air in the cuff, right? So air in the cuff just looks like looks like trachea. Now with saline in the cuff. I would probably do this more in short axis. So those first four, I think, are basically ready for prime time and are pretty cool. And now we're getting into a little more fringy stuff. But I actually really like this next thing, this epiglottitis thing. So, um, okay, so here's, here, here we go. So epiglottitis. So uh, here's home base, thyroid cartilage, right? I told you thyroid cartilage and people looks like a, like a V, like an upside down V or like a pyramid. You know from your anatomy that above the thyroid cartilage, you're going to get the hyoid bone. That's the next like kind of bony or cartilaginous structure that you're going to run into. So there's the there's a little bit of there's a there's a little bit of a membrane in between the two. But what you should have, like in long axis, you should have the thyroid cartilage. We're going higher than we were before. So yeah. thyroid cartilage and hyoid bone. There's a little membrane here in between the two, between the thyroid cartilage and the hyoid bone. And looking through this little window, you can see people's epiglottis. It's crazy, but it's like easy and e I want to show you what that looks like. It looks like a bird's face, <laughs> doesn't it? You can see like like a little. You can see the eyes of the bird, bird eye, bird eye. Like an emo. And there's like a beak, yeah, like an emu. It's so like an emu. Everybody's got a different kind of emu, but it's all emus. And this is how they describe it. This is from the textbook. So the, so the eyes are the strap muscles. The nose, or like the part, the nose part of the beak, is the uh, preepiglottic fat. And then this bright line is literally the epiglottis interfaced with air, right? So it's epiglottis is the uh, is that sort of uh, darker stripe. And then the white line underneath is where like the epiglottis interfaces with air. And it should have this classic appearance to it uh, in, in everybody. So I actually did this with a few different people in the department. See if you can tell whose bird is whose. <laughs> I forget who this one was. Uh, this is my bird. It's not as cool looking as other people's was, but I've got these dark strap muscles in the eyes of the bird. There's my epiglottis. It's easy to see. So this is between those two landmarks, the probe horizontal. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So we call that axial or short axis, but the probe marker to the patient's right side, and you're looking up in between the highway bone and the thyroid cartilage, right? This is what an epiglottis should look like. This is Jesse Wolstein's. Epiglottis. His looks a lot like a bird. I had a couple other ones too, but his looks actually really good. So here, so the dark line is the epiglottis. 
the preepiglottic fat is in between. Here's the strap muscles. And then that bright line is the interface between the epiglottis and air, which is the back of the airway. So it always looks like a bird in people who don't have epiglottitis. And when they do have epiglottitis, it looks like a dog snout, kind of, they call that. <laughs> you lose that nice sharp interface, you get a lot of edema in the pre-epiglottic fat. And this is the epiglottis itself being really edematous, right? So it looks a little more like a snout kind of appearance. It kind of rounds off that whole kind of bird beak thing. Strap muscles look the same, but you get a much different appearance of the uh, epiglottis. That's one sonographic finding that suggests epiglottitis. And maybe, maybe the way to do this is to get used to looking at a lot of these and then start looking at kids with sore throats and just kind of verifying to yourself, okay, this still looks normal, still looks normal. And then maybe every once in a while, this is, I had to borrow this from the textbook because I've never, I've never run into somebody with epiglottitis and thought to uh, ultrasound them because this is kind of new agey stuff. Here's the other thing you can do. And this is from the textbook, but again, this is fringy. And this is, this is from the textbook, but this is based on a study that's like small N and hasn't like filtered down into practice yet. So if you do long axis where the probe is sort of horizontally or linearly sort of oriented, the probe marker towards the patient's face, um, hyoid bone casts a shadow, thyroid cartilage casts a shadow, and then right here, PES, pre-epiglottic space, wow. looks, yeah, it doesn't look like much. It's just, just like pre-epiglottic fat here, right? So hyoid bone, thyroid cartilage. In epiglottitis, this paper assures us, you get what they call the P sign. So you get this like this rim that's hyperechoic, and then the shadow of the hyoid bone becomes like the, what do you call it, like the stem of the P. So here's like the loop of the P and then the stem of the P. This is called the, they call it the alphabet P sign. I think that's a bad translation of the Chinese because this was from a Chinese study. They call it alphabet P sign. So this, but this did show up in the textbook. So, in, so I would do it both ways. I would do the the short axis where you look for the face, find the bird face with the strap muscles, preepiglottic fat, and the, and the epiglottis, and it should look like a bird, not a dog. And then do this long axis picture where you look for the P, which you should not find in normal cases. If you find the, the P, that indicates epiglottitis. It's like picturing, like doing this, doing the worksheet for it. They like, like, they like ultrasound, negative bird face, negative dog, positive negative dog, positive dog, positive 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 P. P. <laughs> Well, because I said, as we go on, we're getting a little more fringy in our sort of application. Um, but I, I, I like this idea. I think it would be a fun thing to maybe do do uh, maybe a, another study on. We don't get a ton of cases of epiglottitis, especially now that all these kids are vaccinated. But. All right, pre-intubation assessment. This should certainly appeal to all of our colleagues in anesthesia. In clinical practice, the, the initial approach is like you guys use a lemon sort of criteria or the lemon. Yeah. yeah. And so that's like look externally, evaluate, do the malum uh, set obstruction, neck mobility. And uh, and that's OK. I think that 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 probably fails some of the time. Um, <laughs> I found one study said that the malum score is only about 50, 55 percent sensitive for predicting difficult laryngoscopy. The upper lip bite test. Upper lip bite test. That's a, that's a hot one. Yes, that's new. And none of the none of the studies I found were comparing to that because I think that's relatively newer. Yeah, um, yeah that one's been shown to be much better than malpotty. Can you bite your upper lip? Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you can fully cover the vermilion border, that's good. Partially is okay, and not being able to touch the upper lip is bad. Because that speaks to like jaw mobility. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Your ability to basically thrust your jaw forward. Yeah. And that's what a lot of laryngoscopy is, is like yeah, that is that move of, yeah. of lining up all the structures. Hmm. So that's very that's very very good. Um, there are a variety of so let me show you. Let me just have a malum potty picture. You guys remember this? So here's the malum potty grading system, right? Class one, you can see everything. Class four, as you can see, just the heart palate, which is terrifying when you know you got to tube somebody, and that's yeah. what you're dealing with. And then the the grade of the view is something that maybe not everybody has like in their vernacular, but you, you're familiar with the grade one oh, yeah. versus a grade four view where grade four view is you can't, nothing. nothing. You're barely seeing the epiglottis at all, right? So with the grade three view, you're lucky if you can sneak a little bougie up there. And yeah. You want to have a grade one or a grade two when you're going into pain. So there've been a variety of um, external things you can look at with the ultrasound that have been proposed and studied and compared to these other sort of less uh, objective measures. Although biting your top lip is, is objective, I guess. And it's basically skin to whatever structure. It's looking at like thickness of soft tissue. And so one of the things that have been proposed here is skin to hyoid bone. 
this is pretty intuitive, right? So you slide, you're in the short axis and you slide up and you have a certain number of skin to hyoid bone. You can have skin to epiglottis. Here's this guy's bird face and the beak, epiglottis. So skin to epiglottis. This one is skin to, oh, this is his thyroid cartilage, so skin to thyroid cartilage. And again, this is not all 100% ready for, for, for prime time, but the, when they've compared this, it, it does exceptionally well, right? So, so look at the p-values for predicting difficult versus easy airway access. And they're, they're, I think in this particular study, they were looking at whether or not they were getting like good grade views. And so this is um, distance skin hyoid bone, Excellent test characteristics, distance skin to EM uh, epiglottis, and distance skin to anterior commissure of the thyroid cartilage. So not really ready for prime time yet. I took a look at my own neck and compared it to this. So what's it? Distance skin to EM. So difficult would be 2.39 and easy would be 1.49 with this plus or minus standard deviation. So I said, oh, geez, what's mine? 1.49. I'm right there, baby. I should be a pretty easy intubation. I'm also a Malin potty one. <laughs> so also <crazy. laughs> right. I also checked, I was also curious. And so they said skin to uh hyoid bone. So I took a look at my hyoid bone to skin distance. Here's my hyoid bone. I was 0.476. And let's just double check here. That's really good. I'm like way, I'm like way far end. The the idea is the lower number the better. Yeah, you can do it from the other side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really like this idea. This is not probably 100% ready for prime time, but as a, as a pre-intubation assessment to predict like difficulty in airway and what, what kind of adjuncts you have available, I like this. And this might trickle into standard of care in the OR eventually, because it's like, it's so fucking quick. It's so, you know, according to these test characteristics on relative, relatively small ends, but you know, you could do more, more data. These are really good p-values, like, 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 like very exceptionally good, so. I like this. Maybe we could do like a study on this. This would be something we could do, man. This is easily publishable, right? You guys tube a ton of people upstairs. You put the probe on them. If you know how to do the probe, get a quick measurement. And then all you need to have is like some kind of a measure of how you how you grade difficult versus easy. And it could be just as easy as like I got a grade two versus yeah. a grade three. Or, you know what I mean? And just take note of that. It's actually um, a very good idea because literally like we've got a bunch of linear probes now. Right. You have them right there. So you're doing your nerve blocks? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like it's something that's like ripe for, for study. And I feel like we could just pick just pick one, like skin to highway bones. So you're not yeah. having to measure a bunch yeah, of things. Yeah, it's like it's and it's so gettable. Um, one last thing, and this for me is probably the fringiest of the fringy, is ET tube size prediction. So I put this in pre-intubation assessment sort of um, bucket. And the idea here is that at the cricoid membrane, which I told you before how to find, you can measure the internal diameter of the of the trachea at that spot, and that will be the external diameter of the tube that you should select for intubating peats. Because it turns out that this that like the weight and height based measurements are not always perfect, and you you can attest probably to getting like a, either like a bad seal or it doesn't fit quite right. And so, depending on the trouble with this is that you're talking about usually when we talk about ET tube, we're talking about internal diameter, right? Like a three tube is three millimeter internal diameter. Yeah. This is measuring the, the inter internal diameter of the trachea and the external diameter of the tube that it'll accept. And so there's like, it depends on like what uh, manufacturer you're using, how big the balloon is, whether or not there is a balloon. But there's definitely some emerging literature on using uh, ultrasound to predict what size ET tube would be perfect for the kid. And it's very, very good if you know exactly the diameter, the, the sort of the makeup of the tubes that you're using at that time. Um, I like this as a potential down the road kind of application, but it's probably not as prime time as the others. I think that this, I mean, this is cool, right? This you can, you can see the application. So somebody in anesthesia, yeah, this is actually, I feel like it's very applicable. Oh, big time. Because a lot of times you're, you're making the best guess and like, it's not always the case that a kid's weight or height is going to correlate to the, to the width of his, uh, cricoid trachea, you know? Yeah. And, uh. So I actually really like this. There's other studies that look um, not just at the internal diameter here at the cricoid membrane, but looking at the um, at the size of the vocal cords and the false cords, and just seeing like what the size that is, and measuring right there. Because remember, kids' um, thyroid cartilage is is transparent. You can actually see right through it. I had that before. Uh, so this is what an adult looks like. It looks like a little V, but a kid's looks like this. 
where you can see right so here's the here's the thyroid cartilage and here's their little vocal cords right here and you can measure that with so that's basically it man that's a lot it's a big download there um there's a lot of good fun kind of papers that you could check out i got a few that i downloaded and a couple that i just have on the um on the new vance access but uh any questions about any of that no cool man and uh i'm gonna end that show